Father, we are here in your house. You are always faithful. You always speak. Your word says the whole heavens declare the glory of the living God. Your voice has never stopped speaking to man. It's only we who have stopped hearing it. But today, once again, speak to us. Let your word go forth. And as always, let your word bring forth life. We put aside everything else. And we surrender our minds, our hearts into the hands of the Spirit of God. You are our strength. Speak to us, O Lord. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We go back to the same portion we read last time. This is from Second Samuel, chapter 12, verses 15 to 25. Second Samuel, chapter 12, verses 15 to 25. This is the judgment that came upon David and how he responded to the judgment and how he was restored. Then Nathan departed to his house and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Then on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said, David noticed his servants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead? he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed and put on lotions and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. His servants asked him, Why are you acting in this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, Who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife, Bathsheba, went to her and lay with her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him, and because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan, the prophet, to name him Jedediah. It's the same portion that we studied last week, but we continue to dwell on that same portion because what most people struggle with is learning to deal with issue of pain, with grief. The truth is that most people do not come out better at the end of grief. And therefore grief is wasted. Pain is wasted. Unlike David, we may never experience the depth of tragedies that David goes through. But we all will experience times. Doesn't matter. You may be very young and you may be thinking, oh, does this message mean anything to me? But a time will come when everybody will have to go through grief. They will have to go through pain. When we feel that our world is falling apart. Some of the tragedies of life 
we cannot prevent but quite a bit we can because much of the tragedies like david's was because of his own sin but some of the tragedies we cannot it's a fact of life it will come to pass like i said some are a direct result of our choices and the fact also is when that grief that tragedy that sorrow that comes because of our choices and when we are in pain that fact brings no consolation it actually adds more to the pain because it adds guilt upon grief so as we look at this portion we also have to learn how did he overcome because we see david as an overcomer in the battlefield he's always seen as an overcomer in the battlefield but what we don't see is david is even more an overcome more when it comes to personal tragedies how he overcame the sorrow the pain the grief of personal tragedies how he handled his sin his guilt his loss his pain and how he embraced god's restoration and the first point we have to remember is the first point always that nathan departed to his house and looked the lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David and it became ill verse 15 is so very clear this is not a natural calamity this is not an accident here god is directly involved so the first thing to remember is this remember god so what should i remember what we should each one of us should remember is when if that day comes to pass in our lives that is when my world falls apart remember it is not my world it is his world that's what it means people use this expression in english my world fell apart but the truth is that i don't have a world i don't own a world it is his world so first thing is remember god this is what job meant in job 121 and 210 this is what he meant he said naked i came from my mother's womb and naked shall i return there the lord gave the lord has taken away blessed be the name of the lord he says it is god's world we brought in nothing we will take out nothing so he has the right to do whatever he chooses to with his world it is his I came naked I'll go naked and God gave God took so blessed be the name of the Lord in chapter 2 of Job and verse 10 he again repeats and he said to her you speak as one of the foolish women speaks shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity in the context of what we are looking at it he is saying if it is God's world and everything is his creation then where does the creation have the right to accept only the good and not adversity that's what he is asking he says by accepting adversity i am also accepting it is your world your sovereign and i'm accepting this sovereignty of god No clay has ever told the potter what shape I want to be in. It's the potter's choice. It also means we need to remember our life therefore is not our own. I may kick against the goats, but it is good to remember my God is in control even when I feel everything is out of control. He is still in control. So the first thing to remember is god this is his world everything belongs to him and that's how david reconciles to what is actually happening the beginning of restoration is always going back and focusing on god god is sovereign over my life 
And if so- God is sovereign over my life, I will accept both good and I will also accept adversity. The second thing, we go back to that portion we are reading. Verse 16 of chapter 12 of Second Samuel. It looks so simple because we are so used to it, but don't look. Overlook it. What did David do? He prayed. In the time of grief, the time of adversity, in the time of tragedy, scripture tells us, teaches us, pray like you never prayed before. Scripture actually says he prayed for seven days straight. And it might surprise us, why should David pray? Hasn't God already said, I'm going to kill the child? God has already said through Nathan, this child that was conceived is going to die. And David is praying. And he prays non-stop, literally for seven days. Question is, why should we pray when God says something very close, something very dear, something very, very special is going to die? Why should we pray? Because when it comes to judgment of God, we can always hope that God will relent. Because he says, this is a strange thing which I don't like doing. Because our God does not rejoice in judgment. And we know the stories in the Bible about Nineveh. Moreover, the question is, didn't Jesus himself in the garden of Gethsemane ask his father, Father, take this cup away. Is there any other man who walked on earth who knew exactly what the judgment, the, the, the will of God is? Yet, did it stop him from praying? Father, take it away. When you plead like this, In verse 16 it says, he was pleading for seven days. When you plead like this, one of the two will happen. Either he will change his mind and give you another chance. Or he will strengthen you to go through the pain. One of these two will happen. Definitely one of these. There is no third option. He will never leave you alone and comfortless. If you plead with him. One of these two. If you look at Jonah's chapter 3 and verse 10. Judgment has passed. 40 days and Nineveh will be no more. But scripture says, Then God saw their works, that they turned away from the evil ways, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. He changed his mind because they fasted, they prayed, and they changed their ways. And God says, I'm not judging them. I'm giving this generation another chance. Now look at what God did with his own son in the Garden of Gethsemane when he is pleading. If I'm right, it's found in Luke 22. And uh, verse 39. 39. 39, yeah, 39 to 44. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Didn't he know God's will? The hour of grief is coming, the hour of pain is coming, the hour of tragedy is coming, and his scripture says he's pleading to his father. When he's pleading to his father, the father doesn't relent. Instead, what does scripture say? Scripture says, an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. This is one of the two answers. Either he will relent and change the judgment, Or he will strengthen you. But once you are strengthened, you know this is the will of God. 
And once you are strengthened, learn this lesson. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Now he's not praying for the will of God to change. Now that you have been strengthened, he is praying in agony that the will of God will come to pass. He's no longer praying for Lord, change your will for me. He's saying, let your will come to pass. So when God chooses for you option number two, I'm going to strengthen you, I'm not going to change my judgment, then pray your way through. The third thing we see in in uh, Samuel chapter 12 is in verse 17. Again, something which we take it casually. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. The third thing which David did was he fasted. And he fasted for seven days straight. He prayed. He fasted. He did more than pray. He fasted. He withdrew literally from the world. His fasting is complete. For seven days he was flat on his face before God. He withdrew from everything of the world and flesh. I want an answer from you. One way or other, I am at this point in my life. Until I get an answer, I'm not getting up from here. See, the world reaches to me through the flesh. And I reach out to the world through my flesh. For seven days, he passed the sentence of death on his flesh. The very flesh that had made him fall and resulted in this tragedy. He passed the sentence of death. And I believe as he started praying and fasting, something else was happening. That seven days, I believe, he did the fourth thing. He started examining his life. I believe in those seven days when he was faced before God, God showed David his entire life, the road he has taken. What has led to this tragedy in your life? God is showing. You need to realize after that point in David's life, his falls are practically not there. He hardly ever falls again in his life. He doesn't have great military victories after that. But he has great spiritual victories after that. Because in that seven days, God showed him what he is. And he learned what he is. Seven days, seven nights. God revealed a lot to David about David. And I believe Psalm 51 was a response of that seven days. Of revelation of self. And at the end of seven days, he had dealt with his sin, his transgression, his iniquity. He has re-examined his relationship with God and man. And has put back his priorities. And he is very, very confident about his relationship with God when he gets up after seven days. Most people, if he have fallen so badly like David... And has calamity coming upon as a result of judgment because of our sins. Will not rise up so confident. The confidence comes because in that seven days and nights he has a divine revelation from God. That's why he gets up and he says, I know the child will not come back to me. But I know I will go back to the child. How did he know? How did he know? Usually we are very confident when we are on a spiritual high. Yes, Lord, I know I will meet you. Nobody says that confidently when they have been judged because of sin. I know. That's his confidence because in that seven days, seven nights, something has happened. Because in verse 22, he says, I will go back to him. You know what? This is the confidence you will see in the midst of calamity, Men of God in the Bible have revealed when, when Job says, I know my Redeemer lives. And I will see him. Even if I die, even if I am finished, yet I will see him. I will see him. He doesn't say in the beginning of Job or the end of Job when he is in prosperity. He says when actually judgment is upon him. He says, I know my Redeemer lives. Job's examination and God's revelation. 
David's examination and God's revelation. If you look at Acts chapter 9 and verse 9, you will see another man, I believe, saw himself in the eye, through the eyes of God. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Three days. This is all of Tarsus. Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. And because of that encounter, he was blinded. But when he was blinded, he also was examining himself. And the Spirit of God was showing him. He is fasting, he is praying, and he is being shown, this is what you are. By the time he reaches Damascus, and then he comes after that three days, he is a different man altogether. David, Job, Saul of Tarsus, they all thought they were in control. But all of them learned that we are never in control. Only God is. And God is always in control. And they were examining actually what we keep studying in the church, whether we are in the faith. To really know whether you are in faith, you need to examine our faith when tragedy strikes. It's easy to be in faith when everything is going well with us. It's when tragedy strikes, calamity strikes, when judgment comes to pass, we will really know whether we are in the faith or not. And the, question, the answer is, David was tested and found in the faith. Job was tested, found in the faith. And God says, examine yourself. As David went through seven days of intense examination, when he rose, he rose full of faith. At the end of 40 days, Nineveh examined themselves and took complete correction and was restored. But the prophet who was sent to them remained angry and unchanged. Remember, the fifth thing I want to notice is this. The fifth thing we have to understand, steps to David's recovery is trust. When he rose up after seven days, he rose up with even greater trust. Let me tell you, we humans, we all have an issue with trust. Our basic issue with both God and man is trust. It is easy to say, I trust God, when we have signs of an abundant life. But the question is, what about trust if all these things were taken away? In Job 13, 15, if I am right, Job says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Now this is trust. This is what God says is trust. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. We use terms to show our trust in God by saying, God will give me a job. God will deliver me. God, you know, I trust God for my deliverance. I trust God for my breakthrough. I trust God for... Why is in that we don't just say, I trust God and leave the outcome to Him? It's because we have an issue with trust. Basically, when I say, Lord, I trust you, that you will give me a job, I'm saying I will trust you only if you give me a job. Or I trust you to give me a job. When I say I trust you, without talking about a job, I'm saying I trust you, that you are my provision. How we are going to do it, I have no idea. How are you going to meet my needs, I don't know. But I know one thing, I can trust you. And David rises up full of trust. And he trusts him because he trusts in God's love. I trust him because all his judgments are righteous. That's what Moses says. When my faith, listen to this statement made by a man of God. When my faith wavers in times of trouble, it is only because I made 
God my servant and not my master. That's when my faith wavers. My faith wavers, it's not because I made God my God, but because I made God my servant. He's not meeting my expectations now. He's not up to the mark. But when David says, I trust you, or Job says, I trust you, he says, regardless of the outcome, I trust you. And a whole lot of responses which you see there in action comes as a result of his trust. Because you will see the sixth response over there is he worshipped. But before he worshipped, there are a few things he did. The first thing scripture records is that he arose. This is the first thing he says. He arose. Most people don't arise spiritually from a tragedy because they are wallowing in self-pity. Oh, poor me. You have no idea, pastor, what I have gone through in life. Oh, poor me. God doesn't help us to lie there in our pity. He doesn't. That's why Jesus came to this crippled man by that pool and said, Do you want to get well? When he asked this question, do you want to get well? The man's answer is basically hoping Jesus will have some sympathy on him. Saying, you know what, how many years I have been trying? Do you have any clue? Every time when the angel comes, somebody else jumps in. And I have been waiting here for so long. Hoping he would generate some sympathy. Jesus said, do you want to wait well? If you want to get well, pick up your mat. What is that? The self-pity you are sitting on, pick it up, roll it up nicely, put it on your shoulder and walk away. Simple, as simple as that. No? Let me tell you for people who are wallowing in self-pity because of pain and sorrow and tra- the tragedies that you went through are real. The pain that you have gone through or going through is real. But self-pity is not. It is not. God did not allow David and David if he hadn't arose, if he hadn't risen there, he would have been wallowing in self-pity. But he arose from the ground. And the next thing he does is he washed himself. You have to rise. And then you go back to God and get yourself cleansed with the blood of Jesus. There is a spiritual significance with this. You are washed by the blood. You go back. You are not pointing fingers. You are pointing the finger only at you. Lord, I and I myself am responsible for this mess. And you have rebuked me. You have corrected me. I confess. I repent. I come to you. And I wash me, Lord, now clean. And he says that in Psalm 51. Wash me. Clean. Wash me. Before washing, don't go for the anointing. He goes through each stages, if you look at it, he goes through each of the stages to recover it. That's why it's recorded by the Holy Spirit as to what this man did and how he recovered. He rose. He washed himself. And he didn't even stop there. We stop there. We've fallen. We are in misery. We rise up and we say, Lord, I repent. Forgive me, Lord, and apply the blood of Jesus. And I wash myself, cleanse with the blood of Jesus, and we go. God says, you did not ask for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. You didn't ask for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit to take you through now. He says, why didn't you ask a fresh anointing? Isn't that what I said, be filled continuously with the Holy Spirit? He said, did you read the book of Acts? He said, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, cloven tongues, and there's such 3,000 people, then thousands getting added, then tragedy started happening, persecution began. Now they're getting arrested. Now they're getting beaten up. What did the church do? The church gathered. For what? A fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Scripture says this time they were filled once again with the Holy Spirit and boldness. And boldness. They said the answer to defeat is more anointing. We need more anointing because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. 
And David understands and he says, Lord, I need, I need, Vijay, I need more anointing. And then, what did he do? He changed his garments. Why did he change his garments? When God has pronounced a judgment over you, and you have cried and moaned and prayed and fasted before God, and God doesn't change his decision, and you have put your trust in him and in his love, and you have received the judgment as final, then then when you get up and go, go there is no sign of grief over you. You are saying, I have accepted your judgment over life with thanksgiving and with joy. There will be no sign of grief over me. No sackcloth, no ashes, no torn garments, nothing. I shall go out as if nothing has happened. Because to tell the world that this is my testimony. I have accepted your judgment upon my life. And I am not fighting your judgment anymore. I'm not just fighting your judgment anymore. If you hadn't changed your garments from the palace to the temple and back, people will be all watching and say, Oh, poor David, poor David. Why did God deal with him so harshly? David didn't give anybody a chance. Earlier God said, You made my enemies hold me in contempt because of your actions. Now he's saying, When I go out and I come back, I will not let Anybody hold you in contempt by even the way I am dressed. They will know with joy I have received your judgment upon my life. He went, changed his clothes and then scripture says he went into the house of the Lord and he worshipped. He went to the house of the Lord and worshipped. How do you overcome pain? How do you overcome tragedy? You overcome tragedy by going to the house of God and worshipping God there. That's where the man who was crippled for 38 years was found by Jesus. When he was healed by Jesus, rise, pick up your mat and go. He had no clue who was speaking. He didn't know who it was. When the Pharisees asked him, how come on a Sabbath day you are carrying your mat? They were more worried about that. He said, the man who healed me told me to carry it. He didn't have any idea who it was. But you know what? He was found in the house of the Lord. When he was found in the house of the Lord, he was found by the Lord of the house. Scripture says the Lord came to him and said, it's me who healed you. And then gave him a word of caution. Now walk straight, otherwise something worse will happen to you. Now you may think, oh, when Jesus came to him, he was harsh. No, he wasn't. That was the word Jesus would have told everybody in the temple. Everybody who was in the temple courts that day should have heard the same word, that if you don't walk straight, something worse will happen to you. But the problem is nobody heard, only one man heard, because he was approved of God for being found in the temple worshipping. Because Jesus said, whom I love, I rebuke. And then, verse, the next verse says, then, after from the temple, the same verse, he went to his own house. First he went to the house of the Lord, then he went to his own house, where he requested, and they set food before him. Then he started eating. One of the things which we always I would advise, counsel people who are going through a tragedy, through mourning, personal tragedy, mourning, sorrow, grief, we tell them one thing is that, okay, it's good to grieve for a season, but after that, eat well. To eat well is again a testimony. God has finished his judgment with you, you should also finish the judgment upon yourself. Don't be more harsh upon yourself than God is. He didn't worship because his child was healed. He didn't worship because the child was delivered. He worshipped because he believed God is good and worthy of worship. Now ask ourselves, would we be able to worship God like David did? 
This is the key. When he worshipped. And how he worshipped. Our when of worshipping is always connected with. Always, always is connected with when we go through victories. David's worship is connected with when he was in defeat. And in tragedy. And in sorrow. And the midst of judgment. Suddenly, worship takes a different level of meaning altogether. Because David worshipped when he received the worst news of that season. Job worshipped when he received the worst news of his lifetime. Paul and Silas worshipped when they received the worst beating of their lifetime. What does that mean? It simply means you don't need a reason to worship God. He is worthy to be worshipped. Moses worshipped God even after judgment was pronounced over him. Key, they all worshipped God because they trusted him. And the seventh thing that David does, that leads to his recovery. Verse 21, then his servant said to him, what is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, he arose and ate food. And he, what did he do? What did he do? He said, what did he do? The king testified. Now, does he have to testify to the servants? He could just brush them aside. He could have shrugged them off. After all, they were servants. And he was the king. But he was testifying of the grace and the mercy and the righteousness of God. He testified. Question is, will we give a testimony of how God met us in the midst of our judgment and sorrow? Will we? Will we testify? Each of these seven steps which David took are important in our journey of restoration. We cannot skirt it. You have to pray. You have to fast. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to examine. Check your trust factor. You have to worship. Prepare for worship those things which David did and testify. Usually most people stop there. But there is an eighth thing. There is an eighth thing that God does for restoration to be complete. Now come down, further down. And then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. Now you need to understand, David has many wives. David has many wives. David comforted Bathsheba. David did not go to Ahinom or Abigail or any of the others, to be comforted. David went to somebody who was grieving in the same tragedy. David went to another person who was grieving or was sorrowful. We will never do that. Honestly, the human impulse is that when I am grieving, I would like to go to somebody who will comfort me. I will go to somebody who will comfort me. Not David. Not David. This is called reconnecting. That's how always God does restoration. If you want genuine restoration from your grief, your pain, remember, you have to go and see God's methods. I want to turn with you to two lines in John chapter 19. John 19, 25 to 20, three verses, 25 to 20. Now, there stood by the cross of Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own house. Now Jesus is on the cross. He's on the cross. His end is near. And he looks down and he sees two people. He sees his mother, 
representing family that is grieving and he sees John representing the disciples who are grieving. I don't know what the thoughts in their minds are. Because during those seven days and seven nights, what all went through David's mind, we don't know. What all is going through Mary's mind as he's looking at her son, we do not know. She must be remembering all she could remember about her son. And she must be blaming herself. I should have gone for his meetings. He rebuked me once publicly, a couple of times. That's when the guilt comes in. David must have thought, I should have, I should have never gone onto my roof. I should have gone for the war. I should have, I should not have. I shouldn't have sent that letter with Uriah. I shouldn't have. Think about the thoughts that went through Mary's mind. We do not know. Think about the thoughts that is going through John's mind. He's the one who loved Jesus most and Jesus loved most. And he must be thinking, when that point came, I ran. When we were all secure and comfortable, I gave him my chest to lean on. But when he actually needed me, I ran. I wasn't there. He knew this was going to happen and I was busily bargaining about where I could sit with him. Grief, sorrow, guilt, pain, everything. And Jesus is looking at this. The mother's guilt and the disciple's guilt and he says, you know what, how restoration begins? Connect. He looks at the mother and says, mother, that's your son. And he tells, son, That's your mother. And scripture says, from that hour. From that hour. John took her home. John took her home. Remember, this is the most important final eighth step of recovery. You don't go to somebody who is whole. You go to somebody in your grief who is broken. Solomon there that came out of it represents a ministry, a genuine ministry that is birthed in pain. Genuine ministries are only birthed because God allowed us to go through pain and in that pain we trusted God and then we went to somebody else who was broken. And genuine ministries are birthed. Who's the last surviving apostle? John. Meaning, his is the last The most longest period surviving ministry. A ministry. More than the others. His ministry was there till the end. Are we getting the picture? Are we getting the picture? And that's what God is always asking us. From the cross, He looks and He's telling, Father, here is your son. Son, here is your father. Pastor, here is your church. Grieving Christian, here is the broken world. Go. Will you go? Will you go? In Corinthians, God talks about it. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Now he is called the God of all comfort. Whom David meets in those seven days is the God of comfort. Who comforts us in all our tribulation. For what? That we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble. With what? With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That's how the ministry begins. That's how ministry begins. That's what David is doing. David is going to Bethsheba. As a king, with around eight or nine, I forgot the actual number, eight or nine wives and ten concubines. He had so many. He could have decided, this is my moment of grief. I need to be comforted. Let me go to Abigail. She's the smartest one. She's smart. She will have words of comfort for me. I'll find comfort in her arms. He says, no. 
Let me go to Bethsheba. Why? Because she is even more broken than me. She doesn't know my God the way I do. She doesn't know. Let me go to her. Let me go to her. And that's it. God says, is the way out. When you have gone through pain, when you are going through grief, when you are going through tragedy, find someone who is more broken than you. And connect. And you will see the comfort of God flowing through you into your, that person. And by the time that season is over, you have burst a ministry. A ministry which God will say, I love it. I love it. I want to name my ministry this. God sends a prophet back and says, No, I want to rename your ministry. I want to rename your ministry. Are you getting the picture? This is how God deals. This is how God. So don't ever waste pain. Go through these steps. Reconnect first with God. And then what God has given you during that season, take it back to man. And that's how genuine ministries are birthed. And we we too will have more than Solomon. We'll have a Jediah ministry. Amen? We'll close now. We will pray. Father, every ministry of the Holy Spirit has to be birthed by you. When Moses saw the grief and the suffering of the people of Israel, at 40, his reaction was one of anger. And you had to allow him to go through 40 years of pain and humiliation and brokenness himself before he could, you could really birth a ministry through him. And then when he went back to that people, he had the patience to be with them for another 40 years. For genuine compassion, genuine comfort was birthed in him. And you are telling us today, Pain, suffering, grief. If we deal it the way the Spirit of God leads us and empowers us, could be great God's greatest gift to us while living on earth. You could just turn it around. Just turn it around. I pray, Father, around the world, People will be encouraged to go through the same stages that David went. Receiving and accepting first the sovereignty of God. I will not only receive good from God, but also adversity. There is only one God. And God, it is you. It is not me. Only one God. And I will trust you. And when it comes to tragedy, when it comes to pain, when it comes to judgment, I will plead. I will plead with you. Because I know your heart that you do not rejoice in judgment. That you rejoice in mercy. Who knows whether you will relent. And I will fast. I will pray, I will plead, I will fast. So that I can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. I can see myself through the eyes of God. And then if God still doesn't stay his hand, I receive it with joy. For my judgment doesn't change God's nature. For God is good. He's always good. And he's always worthy to be praised. And worshipped. It is not my circumstances that determine God's worship. It's God's very nature that determines that He is worthy to be worshipped. I will arise. I will wash myself. I will anoint myself. I will have a change of garments. And I will go to your house and worship you. 
No one who sees me. No one who sees me will see any sign of grief or mourning over me. Because with joy I have received your judgment. There will be no resentment. There will be no pity. Nothing. With joy, with gladness. I will truly say as David said, I was glad. Very glad. Very glad. When they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. And I will worship you. And I will come back home. And I will strengthen myself. So that I will not allow this tragedy to stop me from fulfilling God's purpose in my life. I need strength to finish my course. And finish my course, I will. And I will see that God is changing the nature of my ministry through this tragedy. I'll be a compassionate man. I'll be a gentle person. I will not be quick anymore to judge the failings of others. As David was after that point in his life. He could forgive Ashimai. He could forgive anybody. Because he knew he himself had received mercy from God when he did not receive deserve mercy. After that seven nights, David arose a different man. Different man altogether. And I pray God that all of us will rise up as different men and women when we go through our dark nights and we find God in the darkness. That we would be called a set of people who not only worship God in the light, but we also worship God in those dark hours. Thank you, Father. As you people go back home, as we go back home, take each one home safely. I plead the blood of Jesus over each one. Keep us, protect us, until the day of your coming. Keep us safe from every work of the enemy that he will not triumph over us. But Christ in us will triumph over him. Thank you, Father. We worship you. We glorify your holy name. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.